because of this lousy weather, but we've got a great program. I hope all of you took the opportunity <clears throat> to look over the notes that Ken had posted on the website and maybe even printed them out. I went ahead and printed them out. Once I read through them on the website, I decided this is, this is a must program for me. So I'm looking forward to it, but we're not ready. Yet. No, I think we do have some business to attend to. It. And glad to see everyone out. And before we go any farther, let's introduce ourselves. I didn't bring my tag again. I'm David Show, KC4X, and. Jerry, K4GW. What an interest. Jim, KD4X, Jim, KD4X, Jim, KD4X, Jim, KD4X, Jim, KD4X,
Saturday, we held an economic control class for the EOC operations. Had 42 people show up, and that was great. It's an all-day course, we're going to do it again. Probably February, time frame. Um, we'll let you move over this way. Oh, I'm going to move over. <laughs> the beginning of the camera. We're going to uh, do it again in the, time, in the February time frame. What, what the course does is it gives you the information that you need to be able to walk into the DOC and form the command center and act as that control or really walk over there. It introduces you to all the forms, the ICS forms that have to be filled out and deleted. It is all the course, so it's about 8.30 to 4.30. Uh, I'm going to run on Saturday. And we're working right now with our team management on setting up a tour on Thursday night in lieu of the Oxtown Mary's Day. Uh, planning is to go down on Thursday night, probably about 7, 637. To the EOC, we'll show everybody how our stuff is, how to set things up in the EOC, and have the emergency management folks give a quick, quick, brief overview of what's all about EOC, whether they are qualified in it, and then those that want to get qualified in it, we're going to put you there. We're morphing a little bit. At the end of the box coming here, we're doing some re designations. Who has the current orange tag for areas? Okay. We're going to do a rebadging starting first of the year. That's going to change colors and change design. And there's going to be a basic badge. Then there'll be a second one of a different color that's set up for folks that are what's called communications team leader. Those folks who completed all the ICS courses, they completed the net economic controller course and the web EOC course. That allows them to be a team lead down at the EOC or the Forward Command Center. Everybody else can be a radio operator. And then the people that have the net controller qualifications will have EOC added in their tag. And that's kind of the direction we have to go. Because we're working in an ICS environment. We're no longer working in a day when we just roll in and hook up a radio. We're in a totally new environment. We've got to change the way to stay valid in the county and in the state. So we're trying to do that. I will tell you that when I talk with the uh, state folks, uh, we are considered one of the top groups. We're the top three. I won't tell you exactly who's going to be one. We're going to be um, in the training and in the qualifications. We're going to get there. So, again, yeah, we'd like, like to have more people, people come when we do this in the spring. You get qualified in it. That's, That's pretty, pretty much, much it. it. Thursday night, night is that. Okay. This microphone, Don, I don't know what it means. It's blinking. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I don't know if I want to get close to you. Yeah, no, yours is we, we may want to check yours too before you get Ooh, started. One of the things I'm going to check the lights. We're still maintaining the Oxcom Aries net on the 470 repeater for right now. But the Vagabond net and Echo Link have moved to 315. They're going to stay there. But we're operating Oxcom Aries on the 470. We'll go to 315 if we have to. I think I've got a battery. Not my issue, whoever owns this thing. <laughs> okay, thank you, Harlan. Appreciate that very much. All right, we, one of the things, a uh, piece of business is we need to work with tonight. <clears throat> uh, tonight is when we're supposed to vote in our new officers, and uh, those officers will serve uh, 2018, uh, 19, and I'm sorry, 18, 19 and 20. And uh, those officers, uh, for the introduction and for the vote, I'm going to turn things over to Okay, thank you, David. Well, sir, first of all, thanks for the invitation to come here and uh, present this to you. I'll uh, just uh, Get projecting here. I hope. And 
blah. Okay. Almost. Okay. Okay. So I think I need to stand about here. Can everybody see the screen? We're gonna drop the lights. Okay. And this is a very informal presentation, right? Just among club members. So anytime you have a question, just stop me and. Uh, if I tell you we're going to get to that, then we'll get to it. Otherwise, I'll try to answer the question. So I call this program a pan adapter for every ham shack. And the reason is that I was out of the hobby for 13 or 14 years. I was licensed in 1963. I've been licensed continually, continuously for about 56 years. I know you all think that I must have been, got my license when I was two. But I was a little older than that. In any case, um, I was out of the hobby for a long time, uh, and then I got up, up with Doc, who's in the same radio-controlled flying club as I am, and he and I had been talking for a couple of years about uh, the club and radio, and you know, I knew Tim, I know Tim King very well, so I said, well, you know, I've got an old 718 in a box, an ICOM 718 in a power supply in a box. I live in the woods. I I could throw a wire up. And so, so that's what I did. And I started listening to people on the radio and listening to things I had no idea about what they were talking about. Hooking up to computers, ham radio deluxe, uh, digital modes, um, pan adapters. And so Google's a wonderful thing. So little by little, and you know, talking to people like Doc, and then I came and joined the club in February, I started to understand about some of the tremendous technological advances that have gone on since I had last touched the radio. And this pan adapter was something that really intrigued me. And I remember from years ago, people, really sophisticated hams had displays of, of, the, of their band and, and so on. So I said, well, let's, let me look into how I could do this with my uh, meager equipment. I had a good computer. I'm into computers, as you probably will figure out. And I had my 718. Um, so I said, let's see what we can do. So the first thing to, to talk about is, well, what is a pan adapter? And I had to learn that back at the beginning of the year. So there's a lot of different ways you could describe it. Here are, are a couple of key points, I think. The, the, key, the first key point is it's visual. Right? So it, it's adding another dimension to ham radio, unless you were into amateur TV. All of ham radio was auditory or via computer, as I later uh, learned for digital modes. But this gives you an actual picture of signals on a band or a band segment or even multiple bands at the same time. And you can have hardware based pan adapters or software based pan adapters or some combination. I think, uh, for example, I think Elcraft makes a hardware pan adapter, it's a standalone box, I think. Uh, Harold had one up here at one time. Um, and there are some rate rigs that you can come off directly and just go into a computer. Um, and it can be either driven, the pan adapter itself, whether it's hardware or software, you can drive it from a ham re transceiver or receiver if you've got some way of outputting it. We'll talk about that some more. Or you can share, or, or that is to say, you can drive the picture with your actual transceive RF and IF system, or you can have a separate box. And that's what we're going to look at today, is this separate box. And that's an SDR, Software Defined Radio. And that's what we're going to focus on. A pan adapter using a software defined radio as its signal source and a computer as the display. Questions so far? Okay. So back when I started this, back around March, these are what my objectives were. I wanted to have a fully functional pan adapter. So what does that mean? It means, first of all, I wanted to be able to use it with a whole range of, of I'm going to shut mine off too, <laughs> uh, a whole range of transceivers. So I had a 718 at the time. Uh, I then upgraded to a 7300. And I wanted to be, use it with, be able to use it with virtually any uh, rig. Here, this is the club's 706 uh, that I borrowed to set up for this presentation. So there's not much 
a much simpler radio than this 706, but it will work fully functional with this, in this environment. So I wanted to be able to look at the pan adapter, and if I saw a signal, click on it with the mouse and have it tune the radio to that station. And then if I wanted to fine tune it, because sometimes I don't click exactly where I want, or if I just wanted to tune across the band, I wanted to be able to use the mouse wheel uh, to tune. Um, I wanted it to be integrated with any other software that I had. So I mentioned Ham Radio Deluxe. Uh, I use Ham Radio Deluxe logging. I wanted to see if I could integrate it all so that when I tuned the pan adapter, it tuned the radio. If I tuned the radio, it tuned the pan adapter. It set up my log entry um, and any other software that I, that I actually wanted. Later on, recently, I've even integrated that to my hex beam rotator so I can click on uh, the bearing that I'm getting from qrz.com automatically and it turns the antenna. And I'm sure some of you have done that type of integration. Um, you, the, the thing is, I didn't even know that that existed. And when I started researching getting a hex beam, I said, well, wouldn't that be nice to do? And there's hundreds, thousands of people that have done it. And stuff you can buy, little boxes and software you can buy for $15. So if you can think of it these days, someone's done it and, and it's not that hard to do. And uh, since I was just getting back into the hobby, I didn't know what kind of investment I wanted to make back in the hobby. I wanted this to be reasonable from a cost perspective. So I set around $250 as the limit that I wanted to spend on doing this beginning to end. And so I, I, I was hoping that I could do it all with free software. And sure enough, <coughs> there's so much software out there today. And we're going to go through the different pieces of software that I was able to do it actually for less than $250. Maybe if you count all the patch cords and stuff, you could spend $250. But that's, that's it. That's the investment and some time. All right, so what's a pan? PA is pan adapter. Um, and technically, this is called a panafall. This is the pan adapter or screen uh, spectrum scope. This is a waterfall, and we'll see them working. Um, and in combination, it's called a panafall. Now, many of you uh, that have worked on any of the, di the digital modes, FT8 especially, you, you're already familiar with pan adapters because FT8 shows you the waterfall and the, and the uh, actual spectrum scope. Uh, but this is um, for an entire piece of spectrum. You can have multiple bands up at the same time. Uh, depending on the actual radio you use, um, with this particular radio, the two bands have to be within 8 megahertz of each other. So you could do 20 and 40 for example, and I've set that up. Um, what else? So on the um, band scope, that's a visual representation of amplitude by frequency. Right? So here's a frequency. You can't really read it on this. Um, set, can you read it? 7 point, oh, it's this 20 meters. 14, I can't read it, but it's a lot clearer. You'll see it when we actually look on the screen. It's a lot clearer. But that's a 2.5 kilohertz slot. That green represents the bandwidth, same as you would have on your filter uh, on your radio. The SDR, this is a, a, a piece of software called SDR Console. There's several different ones you can use. All of them are free allows you to have filters, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about SDR. Um, change the mode. I'm going to move over here real quick. These are modes, CW, USB. These are filters of different widths. This is the frequency. There's sev obviously several frequencies, um, frequency displays, and they're for different purposes. So this is amplitude of the signal, strength of the signal, and that's the bandwidth that we're looking at. The bottom display, or the waterfall, is frequency against time. So as this is moving, you'll see this 
of course, when we look at the demo. This is constantly moving down like a waterfall. This is the live signal right now, and this is X number of seconds ago because it's falling down. So you see here what this represents is signal, maybe guy is talking, stop talking, started talking again, stop talking. Here's, there is some amplitude information here, uh, mainly the darkness or the density of the band of the waterfall, but mostly you're going to look on top for signal strength. Okay, questions? I can go the right way. All right. So as I mentioned, we, we, this package uses a software-defined radio. What's a software-defined radio? Um, I didn't know anything about that a few months ago either. Uh, essentially, th this is all. This, I should have said at the at the outset. I'm trying to keep this at a at a level where most of us can understand it. I'm not an engineer. I can't really tell you the design parameters of an SDR. But this is what I think about when I think about an SDR. First thing is it's got a very wide front end. It's a receiver. It's got a very wide front end. This little box has a bandwidth of from 1 kilohertz to 2 gigahertz. I don't know how they do it. It's, like ma it's magic to me. Um, and what it does is it, cr it converts the RF in the air from your antenna to digital. Right? We all know that computers only process digital signal. So somehow we've got to get the analog RF into some either we're going to detect it first and send the IF, digitize the IF, or we're going to dir directly digitize the RF. There's two different kinds. One is direct digital conversion. So it takes the RF digitizes it, chops it up into tiny, tiny little slices. Uh, the other type is essentially like this one. This is a super het receiver, a single conversion receiver. So it takes the RF, mixes it, has an IF output, which is then digitized. It, it's a matter of cost, really, like a, a flex or an anon, uh, a direct uh, digital. There's no need for IF. You don't have some of the mixing problems, the IMD problems that you have with super heads, but it's expensive to do. Uh, this is this box costs a hundred dollars, start to finish. So uh, it's okay if you give up a little. Um, but they both work very well. And in fact, I have compared. We can look at that. I've compared signals on this box with this software against my 7300. And there was nothing I could hear on the 7300 that I couldn't hear on this and see, and vice versa. Now, that's not uh, a Sherwood Labs test. I'm sure there's some difference somewhere. But for, I mean, for all practical purposes, for the kinds of things we do, I think it's fine. Usually, there's some filtering that's contained in the hardware, some bandwidth filtering. There's additional filtering that occurs in the software. Um, as I mentioned, it outputs a digitally converted RF signal, RF or IF, but some digitized waveform, and it puts it into the computer. One cable. Oh, that's cables here. Um, and then obviously, there's no user interface at all on this box. Right? There's a USB port and an antenna port. So everything that you do has to be controlled by the software. The tuning, setting the band pass, RF gain, AF gain. And it's all programmed. All right, so how do we set this all up? I'm going to build this up in a couple of slides. The first thing we do, and this has nothing to do with SDR. This has a system, a setup maybe many of you may have already. It's called CAT, Computer Assisted Tuning. It's been around for probably 20 years. My 718, which was 15 years old, had a CAT connection on it. Most of the radios of that vintage have a CAT connection. And that is all you need on the radio 
to do all of this. And what is that? That's a signal, that's a cat is a set of commands that can flow back and forth between the radio. So there's some hardware in, and firmware in the radio that talks to the computer. And it says, okay, detect if you turn the tuning knob. Or, that's in one direction, or I'm telling you to go tune 2KC up. There's a whole series of commands. Now, I don't know what they are. You can see them probably in your radio manual. They're all listed there, and they're all crazy kind of computer codes. We don't care about that. So you take your PC, you take your transceiver, and you plug them together with a cable. This one has a, the, the icon, most of the icons have a little eighth inch phono, mono phono connector and a USB port, a USB plug on the other side. Uh, in the old days, when this, when this first came out, there was no USB back then. There was RS-232 interfaces. They're COM, COM0, COM1, remember all Remember COM1? Every computer had a COM port. It had a little D connector on it for RS-232. Well, now that's all USB. A lot of the software still thinks it's looking for an RS-232. So all these cables that you buy have little drivers in them that, that are called USB to RS-232 bridges, but that's more than we have to worry about right now. You plug it in, the driver loads. Cable costs $15 from Amazon. Amazon smiles at that. Okay, so now you plug this in, and then what do you do? Well, you download some software, and there's quite a few different packages that support CAT interfaces to radios. Ham Radio Deluxe is probably the most famous one. Probably the next most famous or widely used is the DX Lab Suite, DX Commander. Um, there are some specific uh, programs uh, for specific uh, brands of radio. There's something called Win for ICOM. It was originally Win for K3, I think. Um, there's a guy in Canada who sells it for 50 bucks. That one's not free. But the, these other ones are free. I'm using the free version of Ham Radio Deluxe. I've never ponied up the 100 or 75 bucks or whatever when I have it on sale. Someday I might. Uh, so far, the free version's done everything I need. And so what that provides is the tuning interface. So you, you'll see it in a little while. You've got a screen that looks like your radio. It's got little buttons and a knob. And you can turn the knob or you can go and change the frequency and the radio will follow. And if you change something on the radio, it'll change on the display. It's two-way communication. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, you really don't have to know much about computers or even radios to get that part to work. It's pretty much plug and play. It's a little configuration. And like I said, Google's a wonderful thing. You go on there, put in my problem. My HRD won't talk to my Kenwood blah, 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 and you'll get, it. you'll get the answer. Okay, so that, what does that have to do with the pan adapter? So the next piece is to get the visual display on the computer screen. Um, so we buy this little SDR and download a piece of software. And there's at least four that I know of really good independent pieces of software to run SDRs to help you receive with them. The one I use is called SDR Console. I've also used SDR Uno and HDSDR. There's something called uh, SDR Sharp or something like that I've played around with. Um, but they all do essentially the same thing. They let you see the band in one or more views and let you somehow interface to the rest of the software. Well, what I've shown here is I just hooked that up in parallel. So they're both plugged into the PC, but they're not talking to each other yet. So first of all, you need if you were going to do it like this, you'd need multiple antennas. You'd need a receive antenna and your normal transceive antenna. Then you'd have the problem of overload, because when you transmit, you're going to be pumping a lot of power very close to your receive antenna. And this poor little box is not going to like 500 watts coming into it 
sitting next to it. And then there's no integration. I can see the signals and I can um, determine where I want to go. I can even listen to them through the PC, but it's not connected to the radio. All right? So how do we solve those problems? Well, essentially, all we're going to do is add an antenna relay right in the middle. And that's this box. Now, you can certainly build this very, very easily with a relay and some SO239s. Um, or you can buy it, like I did. From This one's from MFJ. It cost uh, $75, I think. Uh, it has a couple of advantages. Uh, what the, the point of it is that you want it to do a few things. So if you look here, the, all the blue lines are all coax, so that's all uh, signal. So this particular antenna relay in the received position, in the unenergized position, is a T. It takes your antenna signal, it T's it to your transceiver, your normal transceiver antenna, and also to the SDR, to this little box. So that's what you can see here. The antenna comes in in the middle, one side. In fact, it's marked SDR, so you really don't have to know too much about it. The SDR side goes to your SDR. The radio side goes to your radio. And you plug the antenna where it says antenna. And you do have to power it, because it's a relay and it needs power. Um, the red line is, uh, this is, this, this switch is prepared to accept uh, a transmit signal, a, a short, just like uh, an amplifier. So most radios have a, an RCA jack to key an amplifier. This particular radio does not have that, um, which is a good reason to buy something like this unless you want to build that part. It has RF sensing. So as soon as uh, I start transmitting, this relay kicks. Right? What happens when the relay closes? It shorts this port out, and it just makes the connection from the antenna right back to the radio. So we're transmitting back out through the switch. Does that make sense? Yeah? So when you're listening, you're listening to the SDR. You can listen to either one. Typically, I'll be listening to the radio. And I'll tell you why. Um, I'll tell you why right now, and then we'll, we'll go back through it. Because, very simply, when you transmit and you're listening to the SDR, you're going to get feedback, audio feedback, out of your between your computer and the microphone. Because even though it's shorted, it's only down about 60 dB. So it's still receiving. Now, that's a good thing. I'm glad you brought that up. Because another use of this, and I always forget to talk about it, is to, uh, as a station monitor. You put a set of cans on, plug them into the computer, and listen on the SDR. Even if it's shorted out, you can actually monitor your transmission and really monitor it, because it's RF to RF. It's not like coming through a monitor port on your transceiver. This is actually listening to your signal, with you know, listening to how clean it is, the bandwidth. Um, filtering. It's really, it comes in very handy for doing that, for making audio adjustments, making filter adjustments, and so on. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, okay. Well, this is a, still a pretty simple station. Um, most people, not, I don't know about most, a lot of people run some more components. Um, if you're running an amp and a tuner, it's no problem, because that all goes on the RF side of this configuration. Right? So um, this is the way my station is set up. I've got a couple of antennas. I switch them with the tuner. Um, I've got my amp. I key the transmit control. Now, it's probably a good idea to put a relay in there and not actually tie your amp and your transmitter and this box together on one line. But I've done it, and so far I haven't burned anything up. Uh, ICOM didn't like it when I wrote them an email, but it's worked so far. So that's the setup. That's the hardware. So w all we've really done is add this $100 uh, 
RSP1A is the model number. SDR Play is the uh, manufacturer. And an antenna relay or an automated antenna switch. OK. Now, this is where I had the problem. This is where I spent several weeks. Looks very simple now. But how do we get all this stuff to talk? In the software business, they talk about stacks, software stacks. So that's layers of software. Now, I'm a Windows person, not a Mac person, not a Linux person. Um, a lot of people run this stuff on Macs. Most of the time, as far as I know, they're running what, what's called Windows emulation. So they're really running the same software. They're running a, 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 another stack below it would be the Mac stack with the Windows emulation. So it, what that allows you to do is run Windows programs. Most everything out there is Windows. -based. I'm sorry, I've been in your way the whole no, time. You're good. I'm it out. Oh, <laughs> that's right. OK, so we start with Windows. It could be Windows XP. It could be Windows Vista. It could be Windows 7. It could be Windows 10. Now, XP is not supported anymore by Microsoft, so you, you get less support. But it, it, the point is it'll run on just about anything. This laptop um, I bought for $225 refurb from Newegg, the Dell i3 or i7. Runs all this stuff great. Now, my station, I have five monitors in my at home, but that's because I'm a computer geek. Um, you don't need any kind of computer power to run this stuff. Then we talked a little bit earlier about RS-232 ports and COM ports, and I really don't want to get bogged down in this. But the by the very nature of Windows and the, and the IBM PC architecture, only one program can talk to a COM port at a time. It's just a, a, the way the architecture was designed. Whether those are real COM ports, like COM1 and COM2 with the D connectors. Um, so back in the day, there was only one COM port. Everything talked to it. Serial port, right? Ready to send, clear to send. Just like a teletype. Ready to send, clear to send. Uh, a serial line, a ground. Um, the hardware later evolved to USB universal serial bus in which you can have virtually as many physical ports as you want because it's a bus. And if you, like I think there's three on this machine, but I have a little <coughs> hub at home. If I run out of ports, I plug it into one and it's four on it because it's a bus. It's, a, it's all in parallel. Now, um, the software, Windows, assigns each of those a COM port if you ask it to. Right. But still, so you can have COM 1 through 10 through 30, but still you can only have a piece of software, like Ham Radio Deluxe, talk to, I'm sorry, Ham Radio Deluxe can talk to multiple ports, but a port can only talk to one program. So if I say Ham Radio Deluxe, go look for this radio on COM 4, nobody else can use COM 4. Right. Well, that's a problem. How am I going to share all these resources. So some clever people came up with this idea of virtual COM ports. Mm -hmm. right, virtual means it's not really there. Right? Or it's, it's software. And they come, you, they, you, you create them in pairs, like COM 3 and 4, or some people use a standard like COM 1 is paired with COM 10, COM 2 is paired with COM 12. And you do that with a piece of software. And just like with all the other pieces of software, there's a bunch of them out there for free. Several of them are written by hands. Um, the one that I found works the best for me is this one called COM0COM. And I've got links to all this stuff at where you can find it and download it. And just remember one thing. I forgot to put my call on the presentation that's out on the website. I think my call's there where, where it says on the website, not on the presentation. It says Ken Kaiser, K2, but K2KXK, because if you ever want, you know, have any questions afterwards, just drop me an email, my, from my, my QRZ email. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so this creates the, the, the virtual COM port pairs, and that's just what it is. It says 
Okay, here are two. I, I'm going to suggest these two, uh, but you can change them and do it, and you can have as many as you want. Then there's this other piece of magic, and which is all I can call it, called Omni Ring, written by a ham. And you don't even know it's there. Once you install it and tell it what two COM ports you want to use, it sits in the background. And all these other programs call, make a call to OmniRig when they want to share something. It, I don't know how it works. It's magic. But it's free. So it's free magic. All this is free magic. And then Ham Radio Deluxe or whatever your choice is. Could be DX Labs. DX Labs has some more sophistication in certain areas in Ham Radio Deluxe. Uh, as far as support, um, they're both really excellent. Um, and then this isn't really a piece of software. It's probably some kind of firmware built into the radio on a chip somewhere. It's the thing that you plug the eighth inch phone plug in that plugs into the USB that sends the commands back and forth, listens for commands coming from the computer. So it, I kind of consider it as part of the software stack. OK, that's all you need. That's all you need. What that enables you to do is once you have the ham radio deluxe or something in its place, it allows you to add other pieces of software as well. Um, so for example, if you want a log book, you can add HRD log or DX. What does DX call their logger? Nobody uses it. There's a, a logging program that in integrates with DX Commander. Um, one thing I didn't put up here, N1MM for contesting. Perf integrates perfectly in this environment. Um, so DM780 is, a, is Ham Radio Deluxe's old digital for RIDI and um, PSK. WSJTX, of course, is uh, for the newer um, modes. Uh, FT8, Whisper, et cetera. And th what, what happens is you wind up, I never, well, I have a flex now. So I just, I couldn't stand having the dials. But even when I had the, the ICOM rigs, you d I never touched them. You, you do everything from the computer. Now, some people won't, don't like that. Some people really like to play with the dials. And you can do both. That's the, the whole idea of this is it's, it's two-way communication. So if you want to set your band pass on the radio, that's fine. The software will know that you've changed it. OK, questions? OK, I said there's, there's links. So this is where you can buy the two products that I have. I think one of them, well, one's from MFJ, one's Ham Radio Outlet. Um, Here's where you can download all the software. So if you get the, you know, if you go on our website, look at the uh, presentation, you can, you'll be able to just click on these and it'll take you there. I think that's it. Now I do have, um, I'm not, we're not going to go into these, but these are all configuration screenshots. So if you actually want to do this, um, That'll get you over a couple of questions you might have. And then please feel free, like I said, to either call me or uh, drop me an email. So let's see what we've got. This is Ham Radio Deluxe, for those who haven't seen it. And I see what you're talking about with these lines. Um, these represent different bands. You don't normally interface directly with Ham Radio Deluxe if you're doing this pan adapter stuff. I, I don't even know how to use a lot of this stuff because I just minimize it. And what I really am interested in is the pan adapter. So this is SDR console. Um, we've got, uh, we're tuned to 40 meters. Here's the um, spectrum scope. 
So, and here's the waterfall. Now, a lot of this is, um, I don't know, David thinks it's noise. It looks like some kind of signal to me. Um, but how do we, what do we do with this? Well, here's a signal. See the band, the band width? I'm going to try to match that up as best I can from over here on the side and click it. Now I'm going to tune with the mouse wheel. Let's go over here. I don't see anybody there. How about? That looks like a signal. See, I'm off a little bit. I think it's Spanish. Uh, get back to it. Now he's gone. So you can see where he was, but he's you know he's not transmitting at the moment. Um, now the software is obviously a lot of options. Something that I found useful is these favorites. So I set up my own for the phone bands, because I don't work CW. But these are all default that come with it. So we're on 40 meters. We can go to 80. For those of you that can see it, it switched the radio. We're on a 40 meter antenna here, I believe, but we should be able to hear some signals here. Here's one. Yeah, the ICOM radio, well, no, the ICOM radio is providing frequency control. The receiving, the actual signal is coming from the SDR, but it's coming from the same antenna, right? Because the antenna is being split here in this box. They're both receiving independently, which, but the integration puts them on the same frequency. So what we can do, you asked about this earlier. That's the computer. That's. I can turn this off. So that's. There's no radio involved. This is the SDR. This is the output of the SDR. I'll turn it back on. Clearly, right. So. Yes, sir. Right. Right. So visual presentation, and you can receive your own station as well as other stations. And the key is, because I know a lot of people are in the digital mode, if you're in the digital mode, generally you're looking at the audio pass band on your waterfall display, and you can see like all your, all your PSA31, you know, all within that three kilohertz. Right. That's good. That's 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 three kilohertz, right? Yep. That's that's exactly right. What I do in a contest is I'll start at the low end of the band. You just work on one, click on one at a time, going up. You can find a spot. Right. That's a perfectly, perfectly, it's a very good analogy to the digital mode. Because that's what you do in FT8, right? You're looking across the little 2K slice, and you're looking for a little spot to put your audio. Well, this is the same thing 
in a whole band at a time. Sure. Please. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, M1MM actually provides a scan adapter for the IC7300 that comes completely over the patch. Yep. If you didn't want to do the SDR thing, you can, and you have a 7300, you can fire up your M1MM and you can see pretty much the same as what this is showing you. Um, and it's already integrated with your login, with your, your content software. And I just want to say one other thing about that because I hated all the cables all over. I got the Comfort splitter that is summer and a splitter, right? Right. I, I paid like 60 bucks for mine. I got rid of the cat cable. I got rid of all the audio cables. I have a one USB cable from the back of the 7300 to the PC. It handles the audio. It handles my Morse code key. It handles my push to talk. It handles the fan adapter. It'll handle wind key. Or it'll handle... Oh, yeah. And I do absolutely everything over that one cable. It's very true. Did you have, did you get the little, uh, there's a little mod for the 7300? Well, you, you don't need it because you're using, you're not using a separate receiver. I, I didn't need it because the, the pan adapter. Right. The yeah, now I found that the N1MM pan adapter, which they make not only for the 7300, there's a whole bunch of radios that he, that they've written pan adapters for. Um, that's coming from CAT. Right. Um, now, I found that it didn't have the same resolution as you can get here. But it does have something. It does have something that you can't yet get with any of the SDR software, and that's the superimposition of spots. So if you're using N1MM and using the DX cluster on their software, it'll put the calls of the spots up here. So not only, if you're in a contest, not only can you click on them, you can, you can see if you've worked them before. Right. So it changes the color, yeah. So if it's in gray, I worked at it, I won't bother going right. back there. If it's red, it's coming off the, uh, off the DX cluster. There's blue, there's green, there's a couple of there's different multipliers. Uh, yeah, that, it's, 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 it's cool. <laughs> little editorialized. I, I have a paddle and I like to use my paddle on everything, but I, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't anywhere near as skilled as some of these contests to figure it out because they're not using a paddle. They're <laughs> using you know, software. Stuff, just get a field day. But again, the point is that um, using the same USB cable and a, and a RS-232 emulator, you can have, you can let the computer um, do your speed. Sure. And, and so you're just typing DM780, which is Ham Radio Deluxe's digital, has all kinds of facilities for doing that. Yeah. Isn't CW Skimmer a real big one too? Or does that do something else? Good thing to bring up. CW Skimmer, what you built here would work with CW Skimmer. What I built without without an SDR won't, won't really work with a skimmer. skimmer. What Skimmer does for you CW folks is it'll show the whole pan adapter. It'll actually decode the Morse code. Mm, okay. You know, multiple conversations at a time. And for a contester, if you're using something like that, you can find the multiples that you want. Uh -huh. Like a couple of weeks ago in the, in the sweepstakes, you know, I, I couldn't find Maine. If I had a skimmer, you know, I might have, you know, <laughs> do that. Same thing about the scope and play like it's on the 160 drum and all kinds of on there. Mm -hmm. You get to watch it land. Singles at a certain level will be DX singles. Probably. You know, it's just like anything else. You do this for a while and you learn to read it. You learn how to interpret different signals. You'll see who's splattering. You'll see who's dry overdriving their amps. 
very clearly, very clearly. You, I, it taught me what IMD was. When you, when you see signals, that, that, that's a, a good sideband signal. See how sharp both sides are? Sometimes you see them with spikes all the way out. That's IMD. Yeah, Doc. Seven dot oh seven four. Yeah, and and we'll get to. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. You, Jim. Jim. Um, yeah, what we'll do, and we'll see uh, in a second. We'll we'll go to a digital frequency, and there's nothing to look at, because unless you really stretch it out, because in this band, like Jim said, the whole intelligent signal is going to be that width. But on this particular software, one of the reasons I like this software is this. This is, a, this is that blown. It's like a band spread. Remember the old general coverage receivers with band spread? This is 50 hertz to 3K. So that's the audio. Now we don't we're not tuned into anybody here. Oh, yeah, we are. Okay. See, that's his audio spectrum, and you can you, you can use this to tune your audio spectrum. You know, if you've got e any kind of EQ on your transmitter or bandwidth adjustments, like the like the 7300, uh, and a lot of, a lot of radios. Right. Right, the DDC. Right. I'm talking about on the transmit side. You can you can use that audio scope to see, you know, oh I'm I'm you know, right around two hundred hertz I've got a a dip, so I I need to boost that up a little. And you can also advise your buddies of what their audio looks like. Seven eighty, yeah. Um, there you can use their waterfall display just in your audio pass band. I'll, I'll use that because you can see where the noise is in your <coughs> audio pass band. And so most most transceivers, all the icons have the dual pass band tuning. Yes, which is fantastic. Yeah. So There you go. I hear you. So let's go to seven point. Uh, where, where, Doc? Seven dot zero seven four. So this now I'm talking directly to the pan adapter software. You hit enter, it allows you to. It pops up that window automatically for direct frequency. That I didn't do. I did something wrong apparently. Seven should be point point <coughs> oh seven four. No. That's FDH. It didn't do it for some reason. The bottom is showing seven dot oh seven. Yeah, I don't know why the yeah. Should it? Well, it should have tuned the radio too. Oh, you know what happened? When I turned it off, it lost its connection. See how slow it's going? Seven O seven four. Seven O seven. Thanks for doing this for dummy. <laughs> Appreciate that. You are in the wrong band. Yeah, that's right. That's that's eighty meters. I'm gonna it's gonna be tough to get there, isn't it? Well that's okay, just forget it. Okay. But they, that's what you'd see.
two KC. That's all going to fit inside those little green lines. Right. Yeah. And so you'll have 15, 20 conversations inside those green lines. Yeah. 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 I should be able to do it now. Seven O. So that's it, right there. That's the whole FT8. So you don't use it for this. Now you, I could, yeah, you could spread it out. Uh, you can center it, and then you can. Forget how you do it with this software. Drag it out. Zoom. Right. Now I can center it again. No, I can't. Anyway. Yeah, sorry. It's hard to do this from up here. I, th I always tune in 500 half kilohertz steps. Oh yeah, I. Uh, yep. Put your mouse right here. Exactly on. Right there, and then if you if you're off, let's say you miss, you can hear it. What you do is take the mouse. Right, so that's just the mouse wheel. Now, I always tune in in half KC steps because almost everybody on sideband is at a half key, half KC step. In contest, I'll put it back to 100, to a, you know, 100 cycles. Yep. And, you know, like I said, if, if this piece, I'm going to turn the lights on. Yeah. I think I'm done. Um, this is just one example of a combination of software. There's whole bunches of different free software in all of these categories. So if, you, if you're into it, start playing around. And you can do it. There's a thing called an RTL dongle. Anybody see that? I think it costs like 25 bucks. It's, this is 100 bucks or 110. The dongle, now it's not as good as this. It's definitely not as sensitive. But it uh, looks like a little USB, like a, like a wireless mouse uh, connector. And it's got a little uh, coax connector on it. And you plug that into a USB port and use all the same software on it. You just want, I, I, put one, I did that. That's how I got started, sitting in my drawer now. But um, it works. It's not going to be as sensitive. But uh, have some fun. Give me a call. Give me a shout. Something if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I'll be here for as long as I need. Okay, so anybody has any questions, come on. I'm going to ask Dale, if you don't mind, to go ahead and give us a repeat report. And I mentioned a few minutes ago while you were upstairs that we're not looking to run uh, right now, that we're just in going to continue with testing mode. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hasn't been done. Here's your toy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we like you in the blue box. Right there. Right there. Right there.
it was successful. Uh, now I think we're Peters. Let me go to the simple part first. Uh, uh, Baptist Hospital Machines, I don't know if any of you are new here, at, uh, we have a VHF repeater, 146.64, um, down 600 hertz. 100 hertz tone is used on all of our repeaters. That's up at Baptist that, that Hospital, it's working okay, although the receipt is not quite as good as we like it to be. I know we've heard that before, maybe the denying other people have been out there. But there's a, there's a nice pager, 250 watts, 152 that. I gotta make sure I got that to get a little bit of E2 megahertz, which is similarly the um, repeater at that size. So hopefully a filter or a big pass, uh, big pass reject cavity tuned in. I'll take care of it. So that's on uh, uh, the 440 system out there is experiencing the same sort of issue. Uh, we, we have the uh, old antenna hard line, which we believe has been damaged. And the repeater is running off that. The SWR is fine. If it's damaged it, uh, from the standpoint that it appears that there's unwanted signals to get in and plug in the receiver. So there's a new hard line there. And when the weather gets a little bit more fun, right, David? <laughs> it's not terrible. Uh, you know, that 39 antennas, you go out in the summer, you check it, you cut everything. The SWR will be off the wall. Just throw something out there in the wintertime when it's. Raising the cold, and the rest of your arm will immediately be moved. So, anyway, we'll get out there hopefully uh, uh, to work on the after soon. No, 4 7. I think most of you know that we were at the WXI site um, for a number of years. We were blessed to be out there. Mm -hmm. Last December 4th, 2017, we had to move it. Michelle Bob called and said, hey, we got to get your stuff out of here because uh, they got to do some frequency requirements, moving some of the towers and the building that uh, we were in, the power line goes under that, so that went away. So we moved our repeater down to Jerry's Fire Tower, and I'm going to see if you uh, were gracious to make that available to us down here. Welcome, later. And then, again, Jerry went above and beyond Call of Duty and found a site, an alternate site at Saratoga County next year. And we were able to move the repeater there. A little bit further down the mountain, it's an older tower. We got the antenna up there. It worked fairly well for a while. So we think we did a kind of lightning hit probably in the last two months. So, yeah. Lightning hits aren't too good. It didn't destroy the equipment, the link receivers, and some things just had to be reset. But we think an antenna jumper up about the 170 foot level is probably this. We're able to do that thanks to using the equipment from Harold. Harold's here. I don't know where you are. No, Harold. No, Harold no, 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 some, Some of the equipment that, that I use from home and Harold use work well, well as our swamp equipment that is much more for free. free. So, so the summary, summary is that the antenna may be okay, okay to be used with some sort of site configuration right now, but the jumper, jumper probably has or should, should be replaced. That, that's going to be up in there now. now. That, that's around the $700 mark. So we're going to try not to hold it off on saving club money. There's a proof that the board of the last board of $2,000 to spend $800 on a new antenna. Uh, the hard line and So, so far, we can't do that. We're still a little bit sure whether we're going to go there and place a jump over. We're going to hopefully partner with another repeater user out there to keep costs down and that's still on the negotiation. What we hope to do, again, thanks, Jerry. We're operating now off of the one of his secondary antennas, two dive buttons, so they're not on there, they're not on one. We could run one split of the antenna size versus the receiving or the other one. Hopefully, we can get rid of some of the crack ones inside of the computer. There's several other reasons what that might be, but it happens in some of our systems, so we've still got to get more and more investigation. Your technical team is probably going over what, four times? 